Well, hello and welcome everybody to this data talk session. Um, today, we're joined by Mattia Peretti, who is a project manager at Paulus, which is uh, the think tank initiative by the London School of Economics. Um, and we're hosting this informal session today to give you more of an insight on uh, artificial intelligence specifically uh, for journalism. And this will mostly be, um, well, Mattia will give a short introduction on his work, tell us a bit more about what he does and, and what the what the project's all about. And then in the meantime, everybody's free to ask questions. You can either do that by um, typing in the chat or raising your hand, uh, and then we can address those. Um, and for more elaborate questions, um, I ask you to please leave them to the end and we can do this in a more of a general Q&A. Um, so if there, uh, any questions for uh, for the for the meeting? Please go ahead and ask now. Um, otherwise, I would give the floor to Mattia. Thank you, Ray. I will get started if there are no questions. So, thank you so much to the team for the invitation. Uh, as we discussed, uh, let's keep this informal. So, I'm just going to give a brief introduction about the project that I'm working on, and then we can. Uh, talk together and answer any questions you might have. Uh, so as Ray perfectly uh, introduced, uh, I manage Journalism AI, which is a small project run uh, at uh, Polis, which is the think tank of the LSC here in London, and it's funded by the Google News Initiative. I work with uh, Professor Charlie Beckett, who is the director of the project and the mastermind behind it. And uh, we have been working on this uh, since uh, early 2019. Uh, the reason why we started doing this project is because there was the curiosity on our side to, to really understand what artificial intelligence means for journalism. Uh, there was some buzz over the previous years about those two beautiful words, artificial and intelligence. Uh, and we were really curious to understand what was real and what was not behind the buzz. And therefore, we started doing some uh, research in 2019, uh, especially by talking with uh, news organizations across the world that, to our knowledge, were already using AI one way or another. Of course, that means different things. So sometimes it means big organizations adopting the technology at scale already, while in other cases, smaller newsrooms across the world were starting to do the first experiments, maybe with machine learning specifically. And uh, as a result of those conversations with uh, uh, 70 plus, 70 months, two, I don't remember, uh, news organizations that we surveyed, we published uh, uh, a report in late 2019, which tried to paint a picture of the state of the art. So what are newsrooms doing with artificial intelligence? Uh, what are the various technologies that might be used and how they might be used across the news making uh, process? but not just the applications. We were also very interested in the human aspect. So we asked the newsrooms and journalists how they are interacting with these new technologies, how they are learning to use them, uh, what are their concerns, if they have any for the future, as well as what are their expectations in terms of what these new technologies can do for them to improve their journalism and the value they produce for their audiences. So we published this uh, report in 2019 uh, in November last year, so it's about it's, next week, I think, is the one year anniversary of the publication of the report. And uh, with the findings of the report, uh, then we came together again with our partners of the Google News Initiative, and we decided to continue the project rather than to stop with the publication of the report, because we noticed there was a lot of opportunity to actually really help newsrooms understand what AI can be for them, how it can be used, and what they should do to move the first uh, steps in the right direction. We decided to do that uh, with uh, a combination of different initiatives. First of all, we started to design and create uh, training materials. So not only highlighting the training resources that were already available from other sources uh, out there, but also by building our own training course, the first one that we published in April, which is an introduction to machine learning for journalists. It's on the training center of the Google News Initiative, and it can be taken by uh, you know, anyone, you too. It's been already used, I think, by 40,000 plus journalists across the world. And uh, building on that course, uh, we were designing over the past few weeks a second one, which we're going to publish in uh, December, which will go from theory to practice and really teach the fundamentals of how to train a machine learning model for journalistic investigations specifically. 
On the, on the side of the training, we also did a lot of uh, outreach work to get information to inform news organizations of the potential of AI. This means uh, a weekly newsletter that we run where we create the best uh, uh, research and articles and findings and initiatives that we find at the intersection of AI and journalism, as well, of course, as highlighting our own work. And we have also been doing uh, interviews with uh, um, people working with AI in newsrooms, specifically women, on one side uh, to show the new career path that these new technologies are opening up for people in newsrooms, the new job titles that didn't exist before, uh, and also to do our little uh, contribution to fixing the horrific, at the moment, gender balance when it comes to people working in AI in newsrooms specifically. The third initiative that we're running this year, and I'm gonna wrap up with this one, my introduction, is uh, called the Collab, which is short for Collaborative Experiment. Uh, the idea started from the survey where uh, we um, heard from the newsrooms we interviewed that they were really keen in considering opportunities for collaboration around AI. Um, a wide majority of the people we surveyed, of the newsroom we surveyed, uh, said that they were really keen in understanding what they could do with others together. On one side, not to reinvent uh, the wheel and everybody doing the same things in uh, parallel. On the other side, because it's a very complex and often expensive technology, and many newsrooms understand that if they want to stay on top of the game, collaboration is probably the only way forward if they don't have the resources in-house to build the new AI power tools and uh, technologies. So from this idea of the collaboration, we gathered in uh, June about uh, 20 news organizations from all over the world. And we asked them to tell us what were their challenges that they were facing in the newsroom that they thought uh, AI could or might at least help us overcome, uh, help them overcome, of course. And uh, from those challenges, we formed uh, five international teams that selected a specific topic to work on. And they've been working for the past uh, five months, almost six uh, together, not yet on prototyping actual solutions that would have been a bit too ambitious, but at least on imagining what new ideas might come up and what new tools AI might help us build, and also doing some little tests and experiments with existing tools that they might have in the newsroom or that exist in the market from uh, tool providers out there. The results of these five teams are gonna be presented at our festival, which is gonna take place online in a month, and I'm sure we can discuss that in the conversation later. And they're gonna be really not just uh, a way to help the participate in newsrooms to get something new they can use but we really hope these are findings that are going to be useful for the entire industry and for any other news organizations that want to think and try to move some steps in the direction of adopting AI in the newsroom so that's the very high level introduction of everything we do and of course I'm happy to go into the specifics in the conversation thank you for this general introduction Mattia um, I would like to open the floor to questions to the audience. Please um, type your question in the chat or raise your hand if you have a question. It, it felt a bit like a, 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 say a, a cliffhanger. You then there are five teams working already on this, but Mattia, but you didn't say what, what they are focusing on. We can't keep us on hold now. You need to tell us what those five are, uh, groups are. Of course, there was some good clickbaiting on my side, so thanks for following up. Uh, yeah, so the work of the teams is very uh, diverse. So um, one team is working on something that sounds a bit counterintuitive, maybe. If you ever come across the idea of AI uh, building or creating and amplifying bias, is to see how AI technologies can help them overcome their own biases that already exist in newsrooms, not as a result of the technology. So they have a multi-layered approach where they're trying to uh, understand, identify, and then hopefully mitigate biases that already exist in, uh, in newsroom. And they're experimenting with some uh, existing tools in partnerships with others. And they're also just putting together a study of what newsroom should, newsroom should consider when it comes to their own biases and what existing AI tools might help them address them. A good example is the famous uh, Janet bot developed by the Financial Times uh, that uh, sifts through all the images used by the FT 
and inform reporters if there is a good gender balance of the images that are used in the newspaper. That's just one very specific example. So this team is looking at uh, more opportunities to move in, a, in that direction and to help newsrooms fight uh, bias. Uh, two teams are working on a rather similar topic, but with slightly different angles. Both of them are interested in understanding how we can put the power of newsroom archives in the hands of the uh, reporters and the, audience, and the audiences, and that's the difference. So one team is working specifically on thinking of imagining what tool might be created for reporters that uses the existing content in the archive and recommends existing content to a reporter that is building and designing and producing a new article, a new story, so that they might be better equipped to provide the right context in the article, uh, as well as maybe finding out that something exciting on the topic has been written already by someone else in, new in the newsroom, and therefore there is an opportunity for uh, efficiency in there. While the other team, the different angles, is that they're looking at how those content in the archive and specifically what they called evergreens which are articles of uh, value regardless of the time so they're not related to a specific news uh, information that happens in the specific moment and they're looking at how those can be used by journalists to help us the audiences actually get better and more accessible and they say snackable content which is a word that i really like and the last two teams instead are more on the engagement side of the story. So one team is uh, imagining and trying to come up with a step-by-step -step approach to create a recommendation engine for users that might optimize the recommendation of stories that readers, ourselves, we might be interested in uh, uh, reading and following and trying to map what are all the things that a newsroom need to take into account in order to optimize that recommendation engine to the needs of the audiences and of course as well to improve the reach of their own content and the last team is working on a similar thing and actually the two teams are going to pr uh, present their solutions together because they noticed the crossovers that uh, there was in their in their work and so the last team is actually working on um, how we can increase loyalty in audiences via ai that could mean different things. So they are exploring different tracks on this. For example, to come up with a, a, what they call a churn risk score, which is a way to out AI know who each of our subscribers in the newsrooms are at most risk to stop paying for uh, the news and or what actions can be taken to avoid churn itself. Uh, but they're also working on something fun and a bit more imaginative, which is the idea of gamifying knowledge and engagement. So they're trying to see how AI technologies can help make engagement a game in the sense that as a user, and there are already some examples there, Crux is an interesting startup here in London that produces similar uh, opportunities, uh, about really giving you the sense that you're consuming the news in the same way you might use Duolingo, if you're familiar. Uh, with the language learning uh, platform, uh, so that engagement is created via your own interaction with the news that uh, the media outlets produce. So that's just a snapshot, of course, of their five ideas. Uh, there is much more detail into how they're actually planning to implement these goals. Uh, but I find it extremely interesting personally to see how this comes from their own challenges. So this is literally something that if they were able to build potential solutions in the future, it would clearly help themselves, like the newsrooms that are involved, but at the same time, they're really working hard to generalize their solution so that other newsrooms can also learn and maybe use them moving forward. One of the topics you named is particularly close to our heart, that is the exploitation of the archives. Um, of course, you named the use case of enabling internal use within the editor's room, but I, I guess this would also open up opportunities to share with other perhaps news organizations or other kinds of companies that may need that knowledge to be out. Is that something you know they are exploring or perhaps you're keeping it more, let's say, uh, humble at the moment and, and, and perhaps later you'll be more ambitious? How, do, do you know what focus they are taking at the moment? I think at the moment they are trying to imagine what a solution could be created that every newsroom applies. So in the design process, that is not the consideration of sharing that information between newsrooms. Obviously, at the same time, by working together in very international and diverse teams, they are already sharing internally in the team a lot of like best practice and learnings that one team can learn from the other. Okay.
Uh, one last note, and then I, I shut up. I promise. Was, was, was for the others, the there are two topics you did not, I believe, touch, uh, and I'm curious to know if they are on your radar in some degree. Uh, one is detection of fake news to mm -hmm. something, or perhaps journalists uh, being careful with the sources. And the second, a point related to what you were saying about loyalty. There's some risk, perhaps, of uh, value hacking. Sometimes it's called that is. Or gamification tools like that can be also used to, um, let's say, buy the attention of the users uh, in a way that is perhaps even taking perhaps a little to advantage of them. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just dropping the idea to you. I'm, I'm curious to know if the community of journalists you're serving um, is sensitive to these topics, what they feel about it, and if AI can help there as well. Absolutely. So in both cases, both topics you bring up are extremely important. And uh, I think just let's keep them separately as I want to give two com very clear different answers. In terms of like starting from the second one, from what you call the value hacking, uh, obviously there is a balance to be found in there. And the newsrooms we're working with are very, um, how can I say, they're very careful in the way they build and design technologies in a sense that at the end, they help the audiences sift through the incredible amount of information that is out there. They really want to help their audiences get to the content that is important and relevant for them rather than having to drone into the uh, overwhelming information that is out there. And uh, there is research that shows that that approach actually ends up then being beneficial for the newsrooms themselves. So they're trying to marry the two things. Obviously, we know newsrooms are struggling in many ways uh, financially. So there is an inherent goal of keeping the subscribers so then they can make money. News is a business at the end of the day. Uh, but they are trying to really match the two goals so that one feeds the other, so that the end result is better for the audiences that get the content they need, as well as for the newsroom that gets the content out there and more uh, loyal subscribers at the same time. A different answer regards your first point on detection of fake news. Uh, there is fantastic potential on AI technologies to help there, both for uh, detection of fake news as well as fact checking. And there are some incredible organizations, I could name a few here in London, considered like First Draft or Full Fact, that do incredible work, is exactly because we respect their expertise and work so much that we as journalists, I don't go into the topic. We're not experts on it, so we don't try to pretend we can do uh, a lot in that regard. Uh, but uh, of course, it's on the top of people's mind in newsrooms as a topic. Hopefully a little less after last week moving forward, but we'll see if that's true. And uh, But again, we don't create any initiative that is centered around that topic because we just think there are many more people that can do that better than ourselves. Okay, it was a conscious choice to put it out of scope and focus on, on the rest. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, Thank you. Back to you, uh, Ray, uh, in the audience. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I actually do have a question myself, and then afterwards I see that Elina has, has had her hand up for a while. So um, I'll go first, and then you can go, Elina. Um, Matia, yeah, you've mentioned newsrooms a couple of times, and it might be um, that I missed it, but somehow it wasn't super clear to me. Um, the journalists that are connected to these newsrooms, are they are they companies? Are they the big papers? Are they small publishing offices? Are they What kind of a structure is that? Are you referring to specifically the newsrooms involved in our collaboration or as a, as a whole? Our no, 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 in your collaboration specifically. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, a great, that's a great question. So um, in, interestingly, the collab teams are very diverse in that sense, as in we have some big publishers, like the biggest names you can think of in Europe, in the US, or even in Asia Pacific. Uh, but we also have some very innovative small news outlets, uh, local outlets, maybe from uh, European countries, for example. And that combination has been bringing surprising value to the collab itself in the sense that we are seeing that there is uh, a lot to learn from one another. So some big organizations might have, of course, the tech capacity that smallers do not have. But at the same time, often small organizations able to create uh, uh, so at the same time having and 
Let's see, I think you're breaking up a little. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, that, that's that's okay. Uh, could you re maybe repeat the last sort of minutes of what you said? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so I, I was just saying that, yeah, there are both bigger and smaller newsrooms and that then them working together, it's actually part of the value that the collab uh, creates because they're able to learn from each other and bring very different uh, and valuable perspectives. And is there a willingness from the bigger ones to share uh, their what they know and, and, and what they've learned in tech with even the smaller ones? Because I can imagine it's also well a business model for them. Absolutely. I mean, uh, again, that eagerness for collaboration is uh, shown in practice by the participants. Sharing technology, honestly, I think we're not there yet. Rightly so. The organizations that have been able to build their own technology are careful of not just giving it away to others. But at the same time, a key element of our collaboration is that it's international. Therefore, for some of the, for most of the participating newsrooms, the other members are not direct competitors because a newsroom in Argentina is not competing with a local outlet in southern France, for example. And that makes it much more easy for them to share openly learnings, if not information and technology as well. Great, thank you for that. Elena, you can you can go. <laughs> Yes, thank you. My question actually builds off a bit of what uh, you and John Franco already touched upon, and that's in when when these newsrooms go into their archive and look at data. Um, on the one hand, I think as John Franco touched upon, they also publish data so others can access. But in going through their archives, if and when they spot that there is data that is either missing or that they would need to complement their uh, search or that would add more value to their story, um, how would they find or get this extra data or this um, additional data? Yeah, that's a good one, Alina. Where do they go? When, when the data you need to feed the AI is not good enough or it's not sufficient, what are the main sources of, of data for, for, for these organizations in the news? I guess the answer varies a lot depending on the use case you are considering. Of course, if we are talking about using AI and machine learning to optimize a subscription model, for example, the data is from the audiences that they have. And so there is no other way for a newsroom than collecting their data in a responsible and GDPR compliant way. If you're talking about an investigation, say on satellite images to find out if there is some uh, environmental um, problem happening somewhere in the world, then there are many different ways to source those satellite images that you need to train a model then to recognize others. I'm not an expert in the topic, so take my answer with a grain of salt. Uh, but of course, that goes from scraping public uh, data from the internet, rather from Google Maps or other uh, available map uh, tools, or contacting institutions that collect for different purposes, those data and see if, especially if they're public institutions, if there is a way to get to use that data for the investigation. So uh, again, not an expert in the topic, so I don't think I can go into much more uh, detail, but it really depends on the use case we're talking about. Thank you. There's a question from Esther in the chat. Um, Understanding and reducing churn and increasing loyalty using AI is also a topic in other sectors. Are there specifics to the newsroom environment? Did you look at other initiatives or what can others learn from your approach? That's an, that's an excellent question. So uh, generally speaking, uh, there is a lot that news could and should learn from other industries that are using AI already in much more refined way. And we have tried also to uh, help the newsrooms in our collab get the connections uh, they need in order to do that. So I think each team involved in the collab during these months had one or two conversations with companies that are not in journalism, kind of to understand how they use AI to achieve similar goal, goals and what they can learn uh, from them. Uh, when it comes to what others can learn from our approach, I think we will have to wait for our festival in December to get the answers directly from uh, the teams that are working on it. But I'm a big believer that uh, beyond, even beyond AI, news should often look outside of our own bubble 
uh, to learn best practices also from other industries, not to create the Spotify of news, as many say, that's reductive, but there are a lot of lessons can learn, that can be learned, both in terms of technology and leadership and product development as well, outside of the news industry itself. Great, thank you. I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to go ahead and, and steal the floor there. Um, but see, I know that you've uh, you've been working with these five teams, uh, but is there any um, sort of general difficulty that you encounter in, in all of these five projects? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. So uh, in the in the design of the collab, of course, when we were thinking about this initiative, it was in a pre-COVID world. So obviously collaboration would have possibly been easier. We would have been able to meet in person and have some uh, in-depth and insightful conversations together, also to build that uh, uh, team feeling that it's hard to get when you're just looking at a screen. Obviously, when you meet people in person, it's different. So that was clearly a challenge that we have that we had at the beginning and we had to overcome. Uh, when we were designing then the project, uh, in the specifics of the project in April, we found extremely important to really start from the needs of the participants. It was going to be very hard to convince people to join a project that we were making the rules of because everybody in newsrooms had pressing issues to face because of COVID specifically. Uh, so we did start with this co-design approach. So the participating newsrooms didn't just join a ready-made project, but actually they decided with us what the collab should look like, what we should achieve together and how we should work together. The interesting, actually, and very positive insights from taking this approach is that uh, that's not valid for everybody, of course, but many of the participants involved in the collab actually enthusiastically joined this experience uh, even more than we were expecting, exactly because COVID forced them to focus in their newsrooms to the day to day, to the emergency, to the urgent things to fix and make work. So they, especially if they had a strategy or innovation role, they lost part of their space and time for creativity and innovation and being part of the collab would give them back some of that, uh, that it's a key part of their job title and why they decided to take up their role. Uh, so that was very then powerful, of course, to make the collab work because of how they embraced the process itself. Yeah, it makes sense. I think uh, COVID is, uh, is pretty much uh, all, all of, the difficulties that everybody encounters now anyway right <laughs> of course um, then all the teams they had like logistic challenges yeah. there is a value in having international teams and communicating with people in a different continent but there are also some logistics like calls to be organized across time zones and different cultures sometimes uh, but for what i can say from my point of view the benefits widely uh, overcome the challenges that this diversity brought to the table happy to hear that uh, Elena, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I wanted to ask, and given that um, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, you published your 2019 report, mm -hmm. um, and following the publication, there was the mass spread of the pandemic. Are there key insights from the report that you think are still very are um, enhanced due to the pandemic that you can share with us? That's an interesting question. Uh, I think in a sense, like when it comes to, since the report was so focused on the technology uh, itself, in a sense, I think COVID has accelerated some of the trends that we were expecting to see, even when it comes to AI. That's valid for many other things. It's of course valid for remote working and how newsrooms understood that's possible. Uh, just one example, of course. But also when it comes to the technology, I think uh, people have been quite open to experiment with it. Uh, because at the end of the day, we're, we, are, we were and we are all navigating uh, something that is uh, unique. And of course, challenges we just discussed, but it's also quite a unique opportunity to try new things and be creative because we're not sure what tomorrow will look like. So in that sense, I think maybe the timeline for developments that we were highlighting in the last chapter of the report I would say I think has been accelerated. I think it would be extremely interesting to run the same survey one year from now 
and probably talk with the same people. And I would expect they would say that the trends that we're looking uh, forward to have happened earlier than they than they expected. Um, for the rest, uh, I think the part of the report that I would be curious to look back at uh, uh, in the COVID uh, in a COVID perspective is about the roles in the newsroom as well because we were saying and highlighting how many new roles have been uh, created and are coming up thanks to having to work with these technologies in the newsroom. And that's another trend that uh, I'm speculating here, but it's another one that I would expect uh, to be accelerating exactly because in newsrooms are roles and people that are able to bridge the gap between departments from editorial, technology, product, and so on are even more important today than they were in a pre-COVID world. So that's another trend that I, I think it's fair to say has been accelerated uh, by the pandemic, by the consequences of the pandemic, of course, not by the pandemic itself. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And that links, I guess, to my follow-up also, because you mentioned that several times um, your event next month festival, I believe was the name. Yeah. Uh, how has COVID and how, how is uh, the folk, well, one, what are the focuses of the event um, beyond AI and journalism, as our keywords these today or the session are? And also, how has the pandemic influenced the focus of the event? Well, that's a pretty straightforward answer. The focus hasn't changed at all. Obviously, in our mind, in January last year, this was going to be a very fancy conference in Paris or in London, while it will be in our bedrooms and living rooms. Uh, but beyond that, the focus hasn't changed at all. The goal of the festival is to, of course, present on one side the results of the collab. So that's going to be one of the three key tracks in the program. The second one that we have is to highlight some of the most interesting case studies that we have seen uh, out there of newsrooms doing innovative things with AI that we think are worth uh, showcasing. And the third track of the program will include uh, conversations uh, with the experts, both from newsrooms and also from academia, uh, to really paint the picture of what we can expect from the future of uh, AI in uh, journalism. So the festival is going to be five days long between the 7th and the 11th of December. And each day we're going to have uh, three online sessions independent from one another. Uh, on each day, one session per track of the three tracks that I just uh, mentioned. Uh, it's free to join, anybody can join online. The only thing uh, people need to do is to sign up for our newsletter to receive the updates and the access link the moment we are ready to uh, go at the, at the beginning of December. So uh, yeah, I have a fantastic team working on it. So I'm blessed to have a, a couple of people putting together the festival. And next week, actually via the newsletter, we're gonna announce the full program and the full website as well, where people will be able to see the program, the speakers, and also hopefully a little bit of elements to connect our community and bring it together beyond just listening to the speakers and the conversations. Thank you, that answers my questions. Excellent. I think that's a great uh, teaser uh, that I was gonna ask you about anyway, um, because I, I think, um, well, for the people that are interested, I'm, I'm definitely speaking on behalf of, I think, EDP SEDS team. Uh, this will be a super interesting uh, festival for us to attend. So uh, I'm glad it's free and that we can attend it virtually this time. Of course. I'm actually going to drop in the chat the link to the festival website. So that yeah, that would be great. Information. I managed to do it. Yes. So great. That's Thank the you. The web page. And if you want to sign up for the newsletter, this is the other link right there. Nice. Perfect. Thank you. Of course. Are there any more questions for these last couple of minutes? May I, perhaps? Of course. Yeah, uh, Mattia, uh, help us uh, looking into the future. And of course, we will attend uh, your festival later in the year, but the anticipate something for us. And particularly for from the perspective we, we come to you, that is the one of uh, opening up data and data sharing. Um, uh, through the Commission, I'm sure the UK as well, uh, whether in Europe or not, we all expect uh, your industry, as many others, to benefit a lot to working together more closely. Not necessarily uh, saying that competition is not there anymore, but rather collaborating with where 
wherever there are opportunities to bring together knowledge and information and data. Uh, specifically to AI in journalism, uh, how do you see that collaboration take place in the future? And do you see uh, friction perhaps uh, our team should, should work uh, on, whether it is uh, technology uh, barriers or uh, legal uh, misunderstandings that we need to help clarifying? Where would you like us uh, in serving the community of consumers of journalism product or the journalist community itself? Where would you like us to help? Wow, that's an excellent question. So I think I'm going to take off my journalism AI hat and reply in a personal capacity here uh, to say that, first of all, I'm, an, I'm a big believer in the value of collaboration. Uh, before joining this project, I've been working at the European Journalism Center in the Netherlands, actually, for a few years. And the organization used to and still is fostering collaboration in so many different and inspiring uh, ways. I have seen newsrooms collaborating on reporting on migration, uh, rather and building a tool uh, for, to counter hate speech and loads of different things. And even just by sharing knowledge and information among leaders and innovators in the newsrooms via the programs I used to run there. So I'm very optimistic about the future of collaboration because uh, in the past few years, we have seen newsrooms understanding more and more that there is a value in there, especially since technology is helping us uh, cross uh, barriers, geographically speaking is much easier for two newsrooms that are not competitors, just thanks to geography, for example, uh, to work together and really bring value to their audiences, respectively, from what they can learn from each other. So that's just my general take on collaboration and my optimism uh, to it. I think uh, the availability of public data, both in terms of like training the algorithms and just in terms of like investigating stories is extremely important for journalists. Uh, so we hope to see more and more uh, journalists being able uh, to get uh, public data in a friction-free and uh, efficient way. In many countries, uh, it's still quite difficult sometimes to access data, both for logistical aspects or because somebody in governments do not want uh, that data to be publicly disclosed. So surely as an industry, there's a lot of work to be done to come together to help lobby in a sense to make that data more accessible and then of course when we're talking about data it would we cannot have that conversation without talking of the tech companies as well in the context that uh, we are again important disclaimer journalism AI is funded by the google news initiative but that doesn't prevent from having honest conversations with the journalists about how they should approach the tech companies themselves so at the end of the day when it comes to building ai technologies there's nothing to do. They will always be able to build better tools and algorithms and technologies that newsrooms can do by themselves. But that shouldn't mean that newsrooms should just uh, give up, in a sense, on building their own tools and just work with what the big tech companies there they can provide. There is an incredible potential for collaboration there. And of course, from my personal vantage point, I've always seen the Google News Initiative as doing incredible work in that sense, in helping newsrooms and putting their tools available to them. But it's a tricky relationship that newsrooms should know how to navigate. And as always, if they do it together, probably the outcome is going to be more powerful than if they do it all on their own. Thanks, Matthias. Yeah, thank you, Mattia. I think this is a, a very nice natural ending uh, to, to, to our session. Um, I see there are no more questions left. So um, if nothing else, I would like to thank you very much for this. Uh, thank you for sharing the story on journalism AI. Uh, and we will stay tuned definitely for the festival. Fantastic. Thank you again for the invitation. It was a pleasure to have this conversation. So thanks for your questions. And yeah, I hope to see you all at the festival in December. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mattia. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.